All right, here we go. Today we have Michael Lynn Thompson, former high-ranking member of the Aryan Brotherhood, who ended up leaving the gang and cooperating with authorities against other Aryan Brotherhood members. Welcome to Vlad TV. Thank you, Vlad. It's good to be here. So you were born in 1951. Uh, where exactly did you grow up? Well, I grew up, um, there's a reservation on the east side of the High Sierra Mountains called Big Pine. It uh, sets between Bishop and Lone Pine. And I uh, spent approximately the first 12 years of my life on the reservation there. Okay, and your parents are partly Native American? Well, that I don't know. Um, it's a great question. I, when I left the reservation at the age of 12, I, was, um, I went to live with a um, um, Nez Pierce elder. He was half Nez Pierce, half Irish. And uh, he's actually the one that taught me my ways. Whether or not uh, I have any Native American blood myself, I don't know. I was raised Native. That's what's in my heart, so that's what I follow. Okay. Uh, and at that point, when you talk about up to 12 years old, uh, you lived on a reservation, then you moved. You know, was there any sort of racism early on that, that you were exposed to, or did you feel a certain type of way against other races, or, or not really? No, no, quite the contrary. Um, if there was racism, it was directed toward me by other natives uh, because of my fair features. And I suppose, you know, my elder used to tell me all the time that bigotry wears many, many feathers. And um, I think that's pretty much true. So, um, no, I, I, um, the only association I had with um, racism growing up was um, from other natives. Okay, so at 12 years old, you moved away from the reservation. Uh, and at one point, you actually became a bull rider. I did. I rode the rodeo circuit for um, a few years, uh, traveled the circuit itself, and uh, enjoyed that immensely. So then in 1973, a very serious incident occurred. Let's talk about that. Okay. Yeah, that was um, the murder of... Uh, Butch Nunley and Rue Steele. They were alleged to be two drug dealers that uh, were working uh, in conjunction with um, a man who ran a cartel at that time, John Solis. And um, it appears that uh, they had gotten themselves in debt or in some kind of trouble, so they uh, took it upon themselves to attempt to kidnap the daughter of John Solis, daughters of John Solis. And um, I let John know that that um, that was about to occur, and um, as a result, they were killed. And um, I was convicted of their murders, um, in addition to conspiracy. Okay, and you were convicted of a double homicide. Yes. Okay, and you were the only one actually convicted on all counts. That's true. So you didn't actually do the murder yourself. No. So who actually did the murder? Uh, that was Mike Sesma. He was the right-hand man for John Solis. And um, he carried out the, the execution of both men. Okay, so explain to, you, you know, to me, with you not actually doing the murder, and you, I guess, trying to warn someone of an impending uh, kidnapping, how exactly did you get convicted of a double murder without actually pulling the trigger yourself? Well, it's under the felony murder rule which uh, has just been changed this last year through the legislation. And under the felony murder rule, if you're involved in a felony, regardless of the degree of the felony, in my case, um, Sesma had suggested that I had assaulted one of the victims. That assault was the predicate for uh, first degree murder and the conspiracy. That is now uh, actually before the appellate court, looks like this may be heading towards uh, exoneration. I maintained my innocence from the very beginning and throughout the course of my 45 years in prison. So, um, but now it looks like it's going to bear some fruit my way. Okay, and you're about 23 years old at the time? 22. 22. You're 22 years old, barely in your 20s, and you just got convicted of double homicide. Yes. And how many years did they give you at that point? It was uh, seven years to life. Seven years to life. Now, 
Seven years doesn't seem so bad, but when you added two life to it, it potentially could turn into a life sentence. And oftentimes you have these extremely long sentences that start out with a seven years to life. They do. What it essentially means, Vlad, is that in seven years, you're eligible for parole. So I was eligible for parole after seven years, but I went before the board 18 times. 19th time they released me. And that was after 45 years. Okay. I mean, how did it feel to be a 23, you know, a 22 year old who just heard to life? Mm. Yeah, I'm asked that question a lot. Uh, particularly people are interested in the emotion associated with that. The truth of the matter is, is that you're so caught up in attempting to survive and uh, adapt to the environment in which you've been placed, that you don't have a lot of time to reflect on the fact that you're now serving a life sentence for a double homicide, um, regardless of the fact that um, you maintain, as I did, that you're innocent. Uh, you, okay. have, you have to contend with what you're faced with. Well, but I think you did say that around that time you started to consider suicide? Well, one time, yeah. It, it, it's um, a situation where I'd never been arrested. I'd never been in a cage before. I'd been out running the mountains, uh, working on Arabian horse ranch, riding the rodeo circuit. Um, so when I was arrested, it was one thing to be uh, put into a cage and go through the trial. Um, there was some movement associated with that, but I think the thing that settled with me most when I was transferred over to the prison and put into a cell was that I couldn't do this. Uh, the very idea of, of spending the rest of my life in a cage. And uh, not a very big cage at that. But um, that's actually the reason I wear this rock around my neck. It, uh, there's a very similar rock just like it up in the corner of the cell. And uh, having been raised native, uh, the rock people are significant to me uh, by way of totem. And so uh, with this rock sticking out, I just simply went up and put my hand on it. And um, in the spiritual sense, it spoke to me and it just said, it's going to be all right, little one. And uh, that was enough for me.